ask for their help figuring out which of those needles in the haystack is a real planet-forming disk. No experience necessary. There's a short online tutorial. In about five minutes, you're looking at data, you're helping NASA, and you're potentially making discoveries. NASA has many satellites orbiting the Earth that look at clouds from above, but we need your help to make matching observations from below. By getting the perspective from both sides, we can have a more complete picture of what's happening with clouds in the atmosphere. Satellites see clouds differently than human observers, and NASA scientists could never be in all the places they would like to be to collect data from the ground, which is why we need your help making observations. So we've been traveling around the world using drones and this technique to map corals in 3D. And the, really the biggest challenge we have with all of this data is how to classify it. How do we get the basic number of how many corals there are, how they're doing as a function of changing ocean temperatures. And that's where NemoNet comes in. So we built a video game uh, that ties into our supercomputer and you can download it and, and play it on your iPhone or iPad device. And what you're doing in that game is looking at our data sets that we are getting from around the world with these drones and helping learn about corals at the same time as coloring them and feeding data into our supercomputer. On Planet Hunter's test, we use data obtained by NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. So TESS is a space-based satellite that monitors the brightness of thousands of stars, and we need your help to find the planets within these data. In particular, we want to find the planets that the machine and computer algorithms tend to miss. So auroras affect our technologies on Earth and in the sky, on, in satellites, and they move really quickly, and it's important um, to get an understanding of what they're doing, and citizen scientists can really help with that. What kind of discoveries have citizen scientists made uh, with this project? So one big one is something called Steve, which is actually an aurora that can be seen further away from the poles than the usual aurora. It's very unusual. It kind of looks like an airplane uh, condensation trail, but with a photograph, you can pick up these amazing colors as well. By studying it further with satellite data and other data from the ground, we've discovered it's, it's really like a flow-driven aurora. It's an east to west flow that is lighting up the sky and doing some amazing kind of new, unusual aurora, um, auroral activity that's still being um, studied now. We astronomers thought that disks stopped forming planets after about five million years, but then the citizen scientists at Disk Detective started finding objects that were able to form planets about nine or 10 times the age of that, so into the 40 and 50 million year old age range. And uh, you know, the astronomy community is still trying to figure out what that means. So that's pretty exciting. Because once you have all that data, it really doesn't mean anything unless you have humans come in and help annotate what it is we're looking at. To put it bluntly, they are changing the world. I mean, we have mapped as of 2020 around 6% of the ocean floor. In, uh, in, in 2006, I think we had like five teams participating. Now we've got over 3,000 teams from 80 countries around the world that participate. Uh, citizen scientists are able to look at these images and see deeper into the images than the automated uh, detection utilities. Those are important observations because they're finding things that are, that are missed in the, original, in the original data. Hello. My name is McDonald Chirara and I've been part of the Globe Observer program, which is part of NASA's um, Citizen Science Project. I've been involved in this project for the past six months. I decided to participate in this project so that I get the opportunity to do something cool and interesting in my free time. Please join us because it's a very exciting thing to be involved with, to be able to report and share what I see. I'm not a scientist, I don't have a great camera, I don't, uh, I'm not a professional, but I can be involved in something that's really important. And right now Hey everybody, greetings from the Arctic. Team Hearts in the Ice saying hi. We want everybody at the SITSCICOM to be super citizen science heroes. It's so much fun. Join in.
All right, thanks to Tara for playing that video. Now we're gonna do a quick public sound check. I know we already have some folks um, from the public tuning in via Zoom. People are um, trickling in and then uh, we'll promptly get started at, let's see. Um, it looks like we'll, we're gonna promptly get started at um, 5.45 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but for our sound check, let's start off with Derek Pitts. Derek, uh, one icebreaker we've been doing uh, during our sound checks is something you're excited about. So do you want to tell us something you're excited about with citizen science or just in general? Ooh, let's see. Uh, I'm excited about anything that has to do with space. But, you know, I really love this really cool idea of the fireball tracker. I really like that idea. I can't wait, that, wait to uh, introduce uh, a bunch of folks to that around here in the Philadelphia area. Thanks for that, Brian. Awesome. All right. Uh, next up, maybe Brian, you can tell us something you're excited about for your sound check. All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Derek. And uh, I'm especially excited about the fact that we have a total lunar eclipse coming up next week on the morning of the 26th. Oh, boy. That's pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, and then next up, we have Carl. Carl, what's something you're excited about? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm kind of excited about uh, a science project that I'm about to start doing uh, related to the Sunraiser project that I'm talking about today. Um, I can't give out details of exactly what science I plan to do, but I've got, I've got some really cool ideas for some new science that I want to do with the data. So I'm very excited about getting started on that. Awesome stuff. Um, and then we have a little bit, we have about five minutes until we get started. We might have one more panelist joining us. So I'll just keep my eyes peeled for her. Um, but otherwise, um, let's just go over some quick technical checks. Um, so it looks like um, Brian's gonna be sharing his own slides and he's going first, which is great after we get through our welcome and uh, some brief introductions from our moderator, Derek Pitts. Um, and then I'll, um, we'll be advancing uh, Carl's slides for him and then Candace, if she's able to join as well from JunoCam. Yeah, I'm here now. I, it made me register all over again. Oh, it's all good. Thanks for being here. Um, for our sound check, we've been having people share something they're excited, excited about. Uh, Candy, uh, any cool citizen science things you want to share? I'm just excited I was able to get on. I was starting to get a little worried there. <laughs> oh, it's all good. Yeah, we're always excited to be uh, getting on Zoom. That's always a blessing. Well, we're really excited that um, our extended mission got approved. So we have four more years now of getting great pictures back from Jupiter. Awesome. All right. Um, well, we have about four minutes until we formally start. Um, Mark, do you want to tell any, uh, Mark is with NASA and he's um, been behind all the sit SciCon fun. Mark, do you have anything you want to share with the, the panel or people in our sound check? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Mark. I'm Mark Kushner. I'm the NASA citizen science officer. And Carl, you just missed um, Trig, uh, Trigve. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but he made a surprise appearance at one of our earlier panels. Oh, and I missed it. Um, it there. All of the talks are recorded and they're online at SciStarter.org slash NASA. So um, yeah, he's he's a, one of our uh, one of our more successful project participants from the Sunraiser project. Um, I'm I'm sorry I missed that one. Seems like a he seemed like a great guy. Anyway, he was very generous to stick around and. Let us ask him a few questions. Awesome. Great. Um, any other questions, technical questions from the panel? Great. I want to give a big thank you to um, Tara Cox from the SciStarter team. This wouldn't have been possible without her. And um, we're, we're going to, um, during the happy hour portion, I know that she's going to be on camera and chatting with us all. So just so all the attendees know, um, we are going to um, hear from our three speakers, and this is moderated by Derek Pitts. And then we're going to have a fun SciStarter happy hour right after for about 30 minutes or so. Um, so get your mocktail, your cocktail. We'll just have an informal conversation and talk about why we love citizen science. All right, can I just say hi to Derek? And thanks so much for coming by and hosting this. And I love the Franklin Institute. 
that solar Good telescope. Here, Mark. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm so happy to be doing this. Fantastic. And uh, thank you, of course, to Brian and to Candy for, for sharing their uh, Saturday, their Friday evenings with us and for finding all those great uh, fireballs and uh, the incredible pictures of, of Jupiter. Oh, my goodness. Those are just jaw-dropping. Jaw I know. I wish I had more time. I would just show picture after picture after picture. <laughs> awesome. Well, it looks like we're going to get started in one minute. Um, and yes, we are live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I put a link in the chat for our panelists. If you want to, um, you know, share this with your networks, uh, I'll also put it in here, um, the links to our attendees. Uh, we, yeah, we're live on Facebook, we're live on YouTube, um, and the recordings are all going to be available on our home base, scistarter.org forward slash NASA. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's have some fun. And it looks like we're right about at time, so I think we'll pass the mic to Derek to get us started. Thank you so much, Derek. Hey, sure, my pleasure. It's great to be here today. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. We are so excited to have thousands of you joining us through Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube to learn about NASA citizen science and find ways we can collaborate with scientists to answer questions they can't answer alone. So a great opportunity for you to join with them to work to try to help figure out some answers to some really, really cool problems. That's what citizen science is all about. I'm Derek Pitts. I'm the chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum. Uh, I'm the guy at Franklin who takes care of all the astronomy and space science programming. I write and produce planetarium shows and a ton of other astronomy stuff, including a tremendous amount of public outreach in science that I really, really enjoy. And so it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to help connect all of us with citizen science. I'm moderating today's event, and today's event is brought to you by Citizen Science, by the Citizen Science Association, and SciStarter.org. Hello there, all my friends out there at SciStarter.org. That's your real source for science that we can do together. SITSICON is a two-day celebration of NASA citizen science featuring scientists describing their research and showing you how to get involved, as well as volunteers sharing their outcomes and experiences from the projects that they've been involved in. During the session, SITSI sits, we'll be learning about projects during a fun social hour. Here we are, it's Friday afternoon, the sun has crossed the yard arm in so many places around the world. So here at Sit Size Sits, it's a perfect opportunity for you to sit back and relax and enjoy some science while you're sipping on some libation that you might have. During this program, we ask you to discover the awesome featured projects and RSVP for additional live online sessions on our Size Starter Sit Size Con page. And that's Size Starter org slash NASA. Make sure you go check that out so you can find out everything that's going on there with all the other live online sessions during SITSICON. When you visit the page, consider making a SciStarter account. Many of the projects uh, are working closely, many of the projects working closely with SciStarter to help SciStarter members keep track of their participation and earn certificates and badges. So make sure you sign up with an account at uh, scistarter.org slash NASA. Now, before we get started, we have some housekeeping notes we have to take care of. Of course, you know, when we're doing a program like this, we always need to get those housekeeping uh, details in order. If you're joining us on Zoom today, make sure you ask the questions today uh, in the Q&A section, okay? If you're on Zoom, ask the questions in Q&A. We wanna have your questions. Make sure as you're watching the presentations of the projects today, you think of some really cool questions to ask. I'm sure everybody has to have questions about what's going on with these projects. They'll be really, really exciting and stimulating. So we want your questions. And of course, if you're on Facebook and YouTube, we want your questions in the comments. So please throw your questions in the comments. If you're on Facebook and YouTube, we want you to participate. We want everybody to participate. So uh, please come up with some really cool questions. We have moderators on all of these different platforms. They'll send your questions to us, and the moderators will be there to uh, engage with you to make sure that your voices are heard. We really want to hear from you, so make sure you send us your questions 
That's really important for us to get you in the conversation too. So we have a lot of people tuning in from all over. You know, this is from everywhere. And we uh, that means that we have folks that have never heard of citizen science actually, and others who may have had their names published in peer reviewed journals as a result of their involvement in citizen science. So there's a lot of different people in here, but we wanna, we wanna make sure that everybody has fun and we wanna make sure that everybody finds something that's suitable for them, no matter what their experience is. So here's what we're gonna do first. Let's find out who's joining us today. So on your screen right now, you should see a poll. And this poll is gonna ask you to identify yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Are you a citizen science or aspiring citizen scientist? Are you a student? Are you a parent of a citizen scientist or an aspiring citizen scientist? Library or museum staff and or informal educator, formal educator or others. So jump right on this, click one of these and tell us who you are. We wanna know who you are. So we'll have this up for a little bit just so we can get you all to check in and let us know who you are. So uh, just let us know. We want you to identify yourself as a citizen scientist and hey, 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 I see some results coming up pretty soon. Ah, okay, wow, look at that. We have a lot of folks on board, 72% of those folks on board are citizen scientists or are aspiring citizen scientists. That's great. But we also have 32% that are students. That's really fabulous. And we have uh, some folks from the library community. We have some formal educators and we have quite a few others out there. Hey, you others, who are you? Uh, we're glad you could all be with us today. Uh, that will help to make this a really, really great program because we want to have so many people uh, joining us and participating today. So that's really cool. We have all these guys out here. Welcome to everybody that's there. So now we have uh, we have one more poll question we'd like to ask you. That's going to come up in just a second. And that question is going to be, have you participated in citizen science before? Yes, for more than one year. Yes, for less than one year. No, I have not participated in citizen science before. and Hmm, I'm not sure yet. Well, guess what? Get sure and join up. We want you to participate in this great endeavor, uh, the opportunity for you to work together with scientists to help come up with data that can help answer some really, really interesting questions in astronomy and space science. So that's really cool. Hey, here are the results of what we have so far. That's pretty evenly split. We have 36% who have been in for more than a year, 29% less than a year and about 35% that have not participated in citizen science before. That's great, we're happy to have you on board. And we hope that while you're here at SITSACCON, you'll find some really, really great project, projects that you can get involved in. Fabulous, okay, so let's jump right into the projects. Now, the way this is gonna work is after we hear from our three speakers, we're gonna have a 30 minute informal happy hour afterwards, an opportunity for everybody to get together and chat together and uh, talk about what's happening in their SciComm projects, in their uh, SITSACOM, in their, uh, sorry about that, in their citizen science projects. All right, so first up, let's see, who do we have first up today? First up is Brian Day. Brian, welcome aboard. Oh, oh I see, Carl's up first, there we go. Let me get it straight. Carl Battams is up first, representing his Sun Grazer project. So uh, let's I turn think, it over to- I think Brian, I think Brian was supposed to go up first. Oh, uh, we do have Brian up first. Okay, great. All right. You know how these things go. So Brian Day's up first. Hey, Brian, you're on board first. You're up deck on deck first. So why don't you get started? You have a fireball project you're going to tell us about. So Brian, it's all yours. Take it away. Very good. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Uh, let's see. I do need to be allowed to share my screen at this point. So here we go. Okay, I am now being allowed. So thank you very much. I am going to be talking to you today about a wonderful program that was established by some of NASA's partners in uh, the NASA's partnership in Australia, Phil Bland and Renee Sayers at Curtin University. And they started this program back in 2012, Fireballs in the Sky. Now, I do need to let you know that right now, this project is in hiatus as its overall program is undergoing some very exciting growth and development. And so I've been asked today to tell you about 
where the project came from, what we were doing in the past, and then look ahead to where we hope to go. So I would invite you to go out and take a look at the night sky. And from a reasonably dark space among the stars, you will occasionally see a meteor striking, streaking across the sky. This is a small piece of cosmic rock or ice about the size of a grain of sand burning up in the atmosphere. Typically, you'll see about one of those an hour on an average night. But periodically throughout the course of the year, we will have meteor showers when we get streams of dozens to hundreds of meteors an hour. These can be very exciting. Even more exciting and harder to predict, though, are fireballs. When you have a piece of rock the size of a pebble to, as in this case, the size of a car entering in, and they can turn night into day and sometimes be seen even in broad daylight. These fireballs can also do wonderful things such as drop meteorites on the ground. These are really precious. These can tell us stories of the formation of the solar system, the history of the solar system, and how our Earth formed. These are really important. Now here we're looking at a visualization of thousands of fireballs detected by the Desert Fireball Network. And we can see their orbits in the near Earth space environment. And one of the things that is immediately apparent is that these are not random occurrences. These are arranged in streams. And these streams represent the orbits of asteroids. These orbits intersect the Earth, and these asteroids may have been pummeled and bombarded or even destroyed. But they also represent the orbits of comets. And again, these orbits intersect those of the Earth. And in some cases, we know the comets well. In other cases, we've never seen the comets before. We only know them by their debris. This has profound implications for the safety of the Earth and our understanding of the near-Earth environment. It's important to note here that the Earth's environment does not end with our atmosphere. It extends out into space. So the Fireballs in the Sky program began in 2012. By 2019, there were some 35,000 downloads and 3,500 observations of really spectacular events. So let's talk a little bit about the program that it supports. This citizen science program allows you to support a professional program that was started as the Desert Fireball Network. This is an all-sky camera network uh, stations of cameras located throughout the Australian outback that had overlapping fields of view, allowing determination of 3D paths of fireballs as they come down through the atmosphere. Now, each of these cameras was equipped with an LCD shutter that could alternate quickly between opaque and transparent. And this was coordinated with satellite time signals, so that as a result, any fireball coming through the field of view would have its trail broken into a series of dots and dashes that precisely encode the time to within less than a millisecond. So now we have positional data and we have time data that allows you to determine velocity. And we can see how velocity changes along the path of that object. And so that gives us deceleration. Knowing deceleration allows us to estimate the mass of the object. And so we can figure out where they're going to land and even their orbits. We can see here examples of some of these stations, the, these cameras stationed throughout the outback. Here's an example of a fireball with its track broken into those time signal dots and dashes. The result is we get these 3D paths of the fireballs coming down through the sky. Now, the Desert Fireball Network originally spanned. 3 million square kilometers of the Australian outback, 52 all sky cameras. But now it is in the process of being expanded into a global entity, a global fireball observatory with stations around the world. But you can see there's still significant gaps. And we're trying to fill these gaps with citizen scientists' observations. So, equipping people with an app that will allow you to actually make observations and submit them. The way it works is part of the, one of the functions of the app is to report a sighting. And if you see a fireball, it's going to ask you a series of questions. Did you hear a sound? 
We had a fireball last week that made a big bang here in the Bay Area. Next, I'll ask you to hold up your phone and trace out the path of the sky. You probably aren't lucky enough to have gotten a photograph, but there may even still be a trail in the sky. You can start where it began and ended. Then you're going to be asked a series of questions. How long did it last? What was the shape? What was the morphology of the fireball? How bright was it? Venus, a half moon, a full moon? And as you keep answering these questions, your fireball is drawn and refined and hopefully starts taking on the appearance of what you saw. What color was it? These things can be very, very colorful. And so you can adjust the hue and saturation. Fragmentation, did it break up into a number of pieces? And so as you go along, you're refining your view and getting the fireball to look just as it appeared. Once you've got that information down, then it will, then your smartphone knows where you were. It'll gather that information and send it in. And as a result, we get a sighting. If we get enough sightings from enough different people, from enough different angles, we can make a good estimate as to the path. But then another question comes to mind is, when do I look? Is it just random or are there specific times? It's a little of both. Fireballs can occur at any time. But as we mentioned before, there are streams, there are showers. And the app can help you find out when these showers are and where to look. So this is a great way to get started. So who's this for? Who are we targeting? Well, this is a great opportunity for amateur astronomers, people who are already spending time outdoors looking at the sky, as well as casual star gazers. You don't need a big telescope to do this. In fact, your eyes are the best instruments. Organized camps or individual campers, family activities, participants who are already working in citizen science activity, working outdoors. You can be rural, suburban, or urban. Again, you don't need a really dark sky to see a fireball. These things are bright. They can be even be seen during the daytime. As you notice here, this picture of a fireball over the Grand Tetons in broad daylight. And timing is basically opportunistic. Here you can see a fireball over a high school football game. This is back in Peekskill, New York, back in the 1990s. These things happen. And so whatever you're doing out there, if you have this app with you, you can make a recording, you can make the observation. So as I mentioned, Fireballs in the Sky is currently on hiatus uh, as its parent organization grows and transitions from the Desert Fireball Network in Australia to the Global Fireball Observatory. Now we're taking advantage of this time to expand and update the Citizen Science app. And Curtin University is currently partnering with NASA's Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute in this effort. This is where I come in. Uh, we will be proposing to the Citizen Science Seed Funding Program uh, to facilitate this update. We're currently working to establish additional domestic and international partnerships in this endeavor. Watch for us at the fireballsinthesky.com.au. And also we do, of course, have a size starter account. So thank you very much. We look forward to you joining us in making observations of fireballs in the sky. Thank you. Very cool, Brian. Thanks a lot. Very exciting. Love it. Uh, folks, uh, before we get to our next presenter, Please remember, we're looking for your questions. So uh, as you heard Brian's presentation, please think about the questions you wanna ask. They're gonna come up after we hear from all three presenters. We'll have an open window uh, so we can dive into some questions and we'll be looking for your questions. If you're on Zoom, please put your uh, questions in the Q&A box. And if you're on uh, Facebook and if you're on any of the other platforms, uh, just throw the questions into the comments section. That'll be great. We have moderators who will pull the questions, get them to us, and make sure that we get you involved in our program today, okay? All right, great. Don't forget, we want your participation. Please join in and send us the questions. Up next, we have uh, Candy Hansen. Candy Hansen is going to tell us all about the JunoCam project that she's been working on. Candy, it's all yours. 
Thank you. And someone there is going to show my slides, right? Yep, we got That's it covered. Right. Well, we're ready for the next one. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I am going to describe JunoCam uh, and how citizen scientists actually populate our imaging team. Uh, and I just want to point out because on every page you'll be seeing this, there will be a beautiful image and down at the bottom is the credit to the amateur, to the citizen scientist who provided us with their contribution. So the next slide, please. Uh, Juno um, entered an elliptical polar orbit uh, about four years ago on the 4th of July. Uh, so we're at Jupiter now. And um, if you laid out the science objectives for the mission, you would find that there was not really a need for a visible imaging camera, but we did not want to go to Jupiter without a camera. And so we took advantage of the opportunity to do something different with our camera. And um, so what we decided to do was to invite the public, to invite the world to participate in a flight mission. And so not just sort of passively, you know, see the news releases, but to actually be a part of it. So the next slide, please. So what we did is we, we thought about um, what does it take? What does a traditional imaging team need to do? And so we laid out those functions and you can see them here. Traditional imaging teams need to plan their observations. A lot of discussion goes on because there are generally limited resources. Decisions must be made. Uh, that would be what I'm calling voting here. Uh, when the data comes back, we process it, and then um, we figure out what have we learned. And so today I'm only gonna focus on the image processing. Both the planning and the image processing have been really big successes in terms of having people join us on our journey. And so just focusing on the image processing, actually, I do wanna say a word or two. Um, we have a community of amateur astronomers that help us with the planning segment. They upload images from their own backyard telescopes that we use to see what is going on at Jupiter in between our own uh, spacecraft close passes. So it's an incredibly important contribution. But if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna, like I said, focus on the image processing itself. Um, what we do is when the data is downlinked from the spacecraft to the earth is that we have a pipeline uh, to upload onto our website and I'll show it again. I, it was on the last slide. Um, and um, so we upload raw data because some of our contributors like to start with the most raw version of all. And then we upload, uh, so that would be the lower left in what you're looking at right now. Uh, and then we reconstruct, oh, no, you guys should be up one slide. Did it freeze? Can you move one slide? Yeah, oh, the other way, there. Okay, so um, we upload the really raw data, which you can see down in the lower left corner. And then we reconstruct red, green, and blue images. We, we post that on our website. And then we do a color reconstruction, which is basically just stacking the red, the green, and the blue with a map projection. And that's the starting point. So that's where we stop working and we rely on um, our interested contributors to take it the next step. So the next slide, please. Um, and this and this does not require really fancy tools. If you start with the color uh, version on the left, which is the version that we post, and you use something as simple as Photoshop, you can wind up with the version on the right. And there's lots and lots of image processing tools available to people. Uh, we do encourage people uh, to tell us what they've done. And so this is an example where Vishal Sharma um, said, I used Photoshop, CS6. 
and um so it's it's a really kind of easy entry i think next slide please so here's yes here's an example this is actually one of my favorites to show you how just a little bit of color enhancement and some um contrast enhancement things you can do with easy tools can lead to these incredibly beautiful images that are also scientifically speaking um things we can analyze i mean the the enhancement of the color and the enhancement of the contrast makes it easier for us to see what's going on in the clouds the next slide please and uh, here's another one. This is an example of the great red spot. Even the science is do it yourself. And so we have, we don't specify a particular scientific outcome that we're after. We put the data out there and then our own contributors do their own analysis. And in some cases, even write their own papers. The next slide, please. One of the really interesting things uh, that has happened is we've seen artists join us. And so on the left, you can see this would be the raw data that we posted. Uh, Gerald Eichstead, who's one of our most important contributors, um, flattens out the lighting differences from one side of the image to the other. Sean Doran picked it up at that point and added his own color palette. And the image on the right is actually an oil painting. So where does science stop and art begin? I actually cannot tell you anymore. Uh, the next slide, please. Here's an example of a beautiful image that is also scientifically very, very analyzable process this way. Because one of the things that is interesting is where you see the small bright clouds and they really do stand out nicely in this particular uh, contribution from Kevin Gill. The next slide, please. Here's an artist's conception. And this is actually one of my favorites. One of these days I'm gonna, it's gonna be framed and it's going to be hanging on my wall. And the next slide, please. This is just um, an example uh, showing some of our contributors. The Royal Astronomical Society actually hosted uh, a workshop um, and a lot of our amateur contributors were able to get funding from, um, from ESA. And so we were able to meet in London and get to meet a lot of the people that are contributing to, uh, to the success of JunoCam. And it, and it is a success because of the contributors, not really because of what we've done. Um, that's me in the upper left with John Rogers. He's one of the ones who's writing papers from our data and um, processing the images and, and uh, doing the science. There's Gerald and Sean, I mentioned them already. And then on the right, uh, you can see one of the artists and her, this particular painting she calls Turbulence. And the next slide. So this is where I'm going to end. Uh, and I love this one because it's a person, you know, sitting, looking out their, their spacecraft window and taking a picture of Jupiter with their cell phone. Um, and that's how I think we'd like everybody to feel. And again, there's the website. Um, come and join us. Fabulous. Thanks a lot, Candy. That's great. Uh, very exciting stuff there. And those images are absolutely stunning. Who wouldn't want to be involved in a great project like that? Yeah. That's super. Okay, uh, again, folks, uh, don't forget to send us your questions. We'd love to have them. So you can uh, throw them into the Q&A section on Zoom. And uh, on the other platforms, you can use the comments section to uh, send us your questions. We'd love to, to have those projects, those questions. Uh, up next, Carl Badams is with us with his Sun Grazer project. Carl, it's all yours. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the Sun Grazer project. Uh, this is one of the uh, it's one of the longest running citizen science projects that, that I know of. It actually launched 
around November of 2000. So we're uh, well over 21 years old now. I inherited the project probably 17 or so years ago. And I've been running it ever since. And really what, I guess what Sungrazer kind of drives at is, are these fundamental questions about comets. Um, comets are one of the most uh, eye-catching, beautiful, celestial phenomena that we see. Um, when we get big comets in the night sky, it's not very often, but when we do, it captures everyone's imagination. As scientists, we have a lot of questions about comets. They, they are essentially the the remains of the formation of our solar system when all the stuff in the solar system started coming together to form planets and and moons and things comets are kind of leftover junk from that process and and they're pristine remnants of everything that formed our solar system so we have questions like what are comets made of um how many comets are there out there in space um and specifically with the Sun Grazer project, what happens to one of these comets if it gets too close to the sun? And so we use, uh, with the help of citizen scientists, we aim to address that question. Uh, the image that I've got up there on the screen, that's actually a, a composite image that was put together by one of our Soho comet hunters, uh, Robert, P Robert Picard. And, uh, all of the bright streaks that are, you see at the bottom of the image, they're all comets that we have seen and discovered with our program. And then the image itself, the, the sun is blocked out by that, that solid disk. So this picture was taken from a, a telescope in space on the NASA SOHO satellite. And the, the sun blocks out the, the direct blinding sunlight. And so we see all the kind of the rays of the solar atmosphere, kind of like you would see with a, a, a solar eclipse from Earth. And the unique design of this camera allows us to see all of these comets uh, coming streaming in to the sun. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, uh, how does the, the project work? Um, as I mentioned a second ago, so the data that we find most of our comets in comes from a satellite called SOHO. Uh, it's the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. Specifically, we have two telescopes on SOHO that are named LASCO. There's LASCO C2 and C3. These are these kind of coronagraph telescopes that look directly at the sun with this solid disk to block the, the direct sunlight so that we can see all the, the faint stuff that the sun is doing, like all the solar flares and coronal mass ejections, all the eruptions that are going on. But it turns out those images are fantastically good for comet discovery. Uh, this was not something that was anticipated before the satellite was launched in 1995, but it turns out we've done fantastically well at, at finding a, a huge number of comets. So the Sungrazer project, essentially, uh, we ask our citizen scientists to go to the SOHO website, download the latest NASA data, and that can be either the kind of the nice, pretty processed images that SOHO put online, or you can access like the raw science data and some of our um, successful comet hunters do their own like detailed image processing to, to really kind of enhance the data. And essentially what, what folks need to do is just animate the images somehow and look for little moving dots. And then when you, you see something that you think is gonna be a new comet, it gets reported to the Sungrazer website. And, uh, and then it's, that's kind of where I take over and, and look at the reports and uh, make the judgment, is a comet real? Is, it, is that noise? Is it something else in the images? Um, but if you can, that image on the right is a movie. Could you click on that and play that for me, please? So where that arrow is, there's a tiny little dot that's kind of racing in towards the sun. This was a, a small um, comet that was discovered last year, I believe. And you see it's kind of receding away, curving around. When we get this closer up look, 
Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see online, but it's actually two little points of light, not one. And it turns out that this particular comet was actually more like three or four comets. When we looked in one of our other cameras, we got this really close up view of it. And there were these different blobs all in this cluster. And essentially what had happened is this new comet came in towards the sun and it completely fell apart. It fragmented near the sun. And this is a process that we see fairly commonly with the comets in our images. And there's a lot of science to be had from studying the way these, uh, these comets are falling, ap falling apart near the sun, or actually in many cases, they're completely getting destroyed when they, uh, when they go past the sun. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Okay. So we've had, as I mentioned, the project has been running for over 21 years now. Uh, we've had um, participants from all over the world, from all ages, from all backgrounds. Um, I've taken a couple of snaps from different news articles here just to highlight just a, a, a couple of um, our participants. So on the, on the left, um, Rainer Kruk, he's been with the project. I think he was with the project before I was with the project, and he's still with it now. He's a, a high school teacher uh, based in Germany. And he has discovered a huge number of comets. I mean, hundreds of comets he's discovered with SOHO. But in addition to that, he's also done a lot of science analysis in his own spare time and has published papers. And he even has two comet families named after him. Now, the Kracht group of comets and the, the Kracht two group, they are named for him. Um, because he identified these new families that, that Soho was identifying. And then over on the, the, the right-hand side, um, that's uh, Rafael Biros. He is uh, just last year, he joined the project. Um, his uncle was a, a, or is a successful comet hunter and he enjoyed in, encouraged him to join the project. And Rafael found his first comet last year and he became, as far as we know, the youngest person ever in history to find a comet. He's only 12 years old. He sat there from the comfort and safety of his, his own home, analyzing the SOHO data, and he found his first comet. And I think he actually found his second one um, a few weeks ago. But that's sort of the just an example of the, the backgrounds of people that get involved in the projects. It's really anyone from Rafal's age upwards. Um, we have uh, scientists and geologists and teachers and um, really people from, from all walks of uh, getting involved uh, with the project. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So, um, to get started, uh, you can go to our website, sungrazer.nrl.nav.mil. Um, we have an about page that will give you some, uh, sort of short questions and answers. Uh, we do provide a, a guide and a tutorial. Um, a couple of things I will mention about this. Sungrazer is a kind of a unique citizen science project because there's, um, we aren't able to offer any like official tools. We don't have an app. Um, we can't really offer web-based tools. So there's, there's sort of some initiative needed on the, for the participants to, to decide how they want to approach the problem. Like you can download whatever format of the data you like. You can apply whatever image processing you like. You can use your favorite software tools. You can even write your own software in Python or C or whatever programming language you like. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. There's a lot of flexibility there. So in that regard, it's unique. But the other part of Sungrazer that's unique is it's actually competitive. Um, when the SOHO data goes online, there are usually many people that are downloading it straight away. And any bright comets that are appearing in the images, they're usually reported within two or three minutes 
of the data first being made available online. And it's very common that on the website, we'll get reports of comets that are five or 10 seconds apart reporting the same object. So it's at times it's very kind of fast and furious when there's a big data dump that goes online. Um, there, there can be sort of a, a bit of a mad rush to, uh, to report comets. And some of them, I mean, the, the images I showed at the beginning, the comets look very bright. You, you may get this idea in your head of, oh, we've got these beautiful bright things going through the images. That'd be really easy to see. But if you can play the movie that's on the, the right there, See. Oh, okay. It was just an animation. Um, so there's a little arrow that, that pops up just at the start of the sequence. It moves very quick. There's a very faint little dot there. Um, that's indicating a, a comet that we saw in December of last year. Um, even that comet is relatively bright based on a lot of the comets that we see with Soho. So you're really looking for very small, fast moving objects. So it may sound like there's kind of a lot of cons to the project, like, like it's, it's competitive, very faint comets. But the great thing about SunGrazer is we've discovered over 4,100 comets. That's way more than half of all known comets have been discovered through this project. And we discover on the order of about 200, 220 new comets every year. So we're looking at maybe one, a new comet every two or three days. So if people are, are willing to kind of sit there and get their image processing right and, and hang out at the computer for a little while and look at the data, there are absolutely always um, comets to be found. And, um, and there, are, there are definitely uh, lots of kind of, I don't want to say tricks to, to success, but there's there's a lot of tips that we give on the website. Like there are certain times of the year that are better for comets, certain areas of the images that are better to look in for comets uh, for reasons that are too lengthy to get into now. But um, it is a challenging project, uh, but it's extremely rewarding because the ability to discover a comet while sitting comfortably in your own armchair is uh, definitely a, a very unique one. So, uh, of course, that's an extremely quick uh, overview of the project. Um, we absolutely encourage folks to go to the website. Uh, you can always email me, reach out to me if you have questions. I, I try to do my best to answer every question uh, that I receive. Um, so uh, I thank everyone that has participated in the project so far and Thank everyone who is uh, looking forward to participate now. Very cool, Carl. Thanks so much. I think this is really exciting uh, in that when you're looking for these comets and finding these comets, you're essentially identifying objects that have never been identified before. And the other cool thing about doing this work is you really get to see how dynamic and active the sun is. You know, you get to see all this great activity of material blasting out from the sun. It's that's pretty cool too so yeah that's, so, a, that's a very uh, good that's a very good point actually the just by the way of doing the image processing um kind of just like what what candy was talking a moment ago about with the juno cam some of the image processing that that our participants do is is really phenomenal and they send me these images like the very first one i showed it on my first slide the, the composite image um there's, there's a lot more to do with the data than just to sit there and look for little specks of light. There's, there's an awful lot that can be found from it. So I, again, I, I strongly encourage people who are interested in, in astronomy and image processing to, to go take a look. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Carl. These are all really great projects. Uh, thanks to Brian and thanks to Candy and Carl for all these great things. We have a couple of questions here. Um, I have a really interesting one that, uh, uh, Maybe uh, it, it really is about the Sun Grazer project. It's a general one, but maybe it applies to everybody and it's a way for us to get at, uh, at people participating in SciStarter projects to all, all together. Uh, how old do you have to be to get into the Sun Grazer project, Carl? You, uh, you said you had a, your youngest student there was how old? Youngest was 12 years old. Um, we've had another 
The second youngest was 13 years old. Uh, we've had a, a handful of teenagers who have been successful in the project. Um, a couple of the, the teenagers actually went on and got their degrees and PhD in astronomy. And um, I've collaborated with them on science papers now, which is as now they're in their kind of professional careers as, as uh, professional astronomers. So really uh, there's no minimum age. You just need to be somewhat adept at, at handling the um, image processing, even if it's just Photoshop or there's free online alternatives. Um, as long as you're, you kind of know your way around a, a computer, um, then I think the project is really open to anyone. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Brian, there's a couple of questions for you about um, the capabilities of apps being able to uh, cite fireballs automatically. One person says, is there an app for that mobile, an app that uh, for mobile devices that will turn on and record a fireball when it notices a significant brightness? And then an associated one is uh, similar to like lightning strikes in your area in real time can be cited in photographs. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where the fireball observations can be done the same way in real time? Great questions. So with regard to the first question, is there something that will turn on your uh, camera automatically when something bright happens? Uh, I know of no such thing right now. And um, what we, there are some fireball networks, well, let's step back. There are multiple fireball networks that have been established. Now, some of the uh, cameras, the big cameras that have been established in the past have used essentially triggering mechanisms to try and turn on, but you'll lose some in critical information at the beginning. With the Desert Fireball Network and now the Global Fireball Observatory, our strategy is to basically just have these things recording at all times. And so as a result, um, when something shows up, we get it. Now that means you have to have a lot of onboard storage, but storage is relatively cheap these days. It is doable. And the real benefit of that is then you have data that you can mine for other purposes. So people have gone back and looked at desert fireball data after the fact, not for looking at fireballs, but looking for things like visual signatures of gamma ray bursts or for the near earth passage of satellites using the earth gravity for trajectory correction maneuvers. And so having that archive of data of things constantly running ends up being very beneficial. Um, now, another question was, you know, do, do I think that we'll have at some point real time notification? Boom, there was, there was in fact a, uh, a flash. And actually that does exist today not generally available to the public, but um, my understanding is the Pentagon has such a thing. Uh, this was actually established initially, space-based observations, looking down at the earth, looking for the flashes associated with nuclear tests. And um, there was a group of scientists a few years back who made a calculation that based on the number of fireballs we see coming in, we should be seeing a Hiroshima sized blast in the atmosphere about every five years. And everybody, after doing the co computation, everybody looked at each other and said, well, that doesn't sound right. If there'd been a Hiroshima sized blast, we'd certainly be noticing that. Then a few people said, yeah, but you know, most of the earth is open ocean. Maybe it is happening, we're just not seeing it. And so kind of a debate raged. And at some point uh, there was a conference where there's a general in the air force and who was in charge of this space-based observations. And he was also a professional astronomer. And this 
question got raised and the general just kind of nodded his head and he said, yep, yep, that's exactly what we're seeing. Can't tell you anything more. But uh, so, but the f interesting fact of the matter is, um, yes, we do see these big blasts coming in. Uh, this, this has profound implications for all of us living here on earth. This really is a bringing earth science and space science together. Um, so, and I know someone else has, well, how many fireballs do we typically see happen in a year? And it's hard to estimate, but the, the round figure is about 500,000 a year. That's a good reason to go out and to be looking up at the sky. We just here in the Bay Area last week, we had a beauty and it, it, it let out a bang and it lit up. It was a daytime fireball. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. worth looking for. That's great. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Uh, fireballs, you know, you said about being able to see it in the Bay Area. So you can see fireballs uh, pretty much everywhere. And that's a, right. And that's this a really is not point. something you need to live out in a rural environment. This is something that you can do in the city. This, this lights up the sky bright enough that wherever you have a view of the sky, it's worth looking. Yeah, that's cool. That's great. Uh, so thanks everybody for your questions. Some of the other uh, questions that we had coming from people were related to how do I get involved in these projects? They all sound so exciting. And of course, the, the thing that we want you to do is scistarter.org slash NASA. And you can jump right into the SciStarter page and you can set up an account there and you can get started on a lot of the projects that you see there as well as lots and lots and lots of other projects. Uh, and uh, so now, now that you're all, we'd like to invite everybody to uh, join us, all of our, uh, our presenters, and everybody that's participating here. Uh, it's time for us to jump into the happy hour time where we can all get in and ask questions of each other. We wanna say thank you to everybody for presenting today, to Candace and to Brian and to Carl, all great projects and to everybody that's been here with us listening uh, and for all your questions, thanks so much. So it's happy hour time. Get your sits out now because this is uh, Sci, Sci, Sit. <laughs> right. Don't forget the sip part. Sit, Sci, Sips. There we go. It seems like I've been sipping too much already. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you in happy hour. Yeah, we're going to be right here. I'm going to uh, pass the mic to my colleague, Tara, uh, who's going to introduce our happy hour menu. Yes, so these were uh, drinks inspired by the three projects that we just heard from today. We have a fireball old-fashioned, a nod to Brian's project. Uh, not sure how it tastes, but good luck. We hope it's great. Uh, we have the classic Cosmo inspired by the Juno Cam project, and then Tequila Sunrise inspired by the Sun Grazer project. So if you have these ingredients at home, make them. Test them, let us know if you like them. I have the tequila sunrise. Oh, sorry, no, I have the fireball of fashion. And it is a little spicy and I like it. We All have right. other folks joining us today. Yep, go ahead, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Caroline. Yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen here. We're gonna be posting this happy hour menu on social media in case anyone wants to create it. You can follow us at SciStarter. Tara, I know if you wanna hold your drink up to the screen, I, I thought it was so funny when you sent a picture earlier. <laughs> That's so good. I yes, I have my uh, tequila sunrise. Uh, I was team sun grazer, uh, and then Darlene I know has a Cosmo. Mocktails are welcome as well. We are, it's a social hour. All are welcome. We want to be inclusive to everybody. Yes, and a good point to remember: we have officially switched from a NASA event to a Sci Starter event. So the alcohol part is not part of NASA, and we've switched over. So now we can have more fun. Just kidding. <laughs> They're a great job moderating. And let's see, we have a lot of presenters. We have a lot of presenters from um, today's event. And I see that we have some from um, tomorrow's event. So that'll be cool. And Derek, actually, I know we're kind of putting you on the spot, but maybe you want to get a conversation going with all the speakers. And then we have a little special surprise for anybody still hanging in here. We actually want to get a um, group shot with everybody who's tuning in too, including our yeah, attendees. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the questions I have about the projects and for uh, all of our uh, project leaders here today 
uh, our presenters. And we did talk to Carl about this a little bit, but I'd love to hear uh, some from Candy as well about the range of volunteers that are participating in the program. Uh, you know, Carl had that great list of uh, the, those two that were right in there, but these are projects that, you know, you certainly want to have as citizen science projects, a lot of different kinds of citizens from across the board. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of the volunteers that are in your program? Yes, uh, we have the whole um, sort of network of amateur astronomers who are taking pictures of Jupiter. I should explain the Juno spacecraft only gets close to Jupiter once every 53 days. So for 50 two days, we don't actually have a good idea of what's going on. And that's where our amateur astronomers come in. And um, so they're great. They're, it's a network. It goes all the way around the world. And uh, they're, they're a real active community. Now, it was not as clear to me uh, that for the image processing piece that we would have... Um, I, I, I didn't know how many people would be interested and get involved. And so it's been um, really wonderful, very heartwarming actually to me that uh, so many people have enjoyed working with our data, working with the images. And so I'll just say uh, a little bit more about Gerald. He's a, a mathematician. He lives in Germany and he, he just loves um, analyzing images. And so he's written a lot of his own software. And the interesting thing is that the processing that he does, a lot of people start with his contributions rather than the raw data that we post. They start with his because it's already closer to what they are imagining or envisioning in their minds. And, um, and, and um, so the science that's happening is all very uh, organic because we haven't tried to direct it at all. Uh, it's it's happened because people get interested. They say, oh, look, you know, we can track this cloud from one image to another. That gives you wind velocities. And the next thing you're looking at is, are those storms rotating clockwise or counterclockwise? And what is that telling us? And um, the one, but the thing that I've really loved because I really honestly didn't see it coming was the fact that the art community discovered us. We didn't, you know, reach out to them. They found us. And wow, what, what a difference it makes in even how we as scientists see Jupiter. We now see Jupiter as this incredibly beautiful place in the sky. And that's because now we look at it through the eyes of artists and see it, see it differently. So um, yeah, so it's been a real eye opener even for me too. Fantastic. Yeah, the art part is really great. Great to have that in there. Yeah. Can I Brian, jump in and just say, that's Candy, thank you for sharing that story because it's such a great example of the things that the people who are the citizen scientists bring and contribute to the project that is often outside of the imagination of the scientists who maybe set the project up. And I've heard that over and over from project leaders and I, I appreciate you bringing that forward. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me because as a scientist, you know, I am, I am so careful about how I process my data, right? But when I see something that someone else has done where they've, you know, they've seen roses on Jupiter, I'm like, oh my God, now I see roses on Jupiter. And wow, isn't that fabulous? So it's, it's, it's really been wonderful. Awesome. Sorry, go ahead, Carolyn. No, I just wanted to see all the faces and I'll, I'll hand the mic back to you, Derek, but just for a quick happy hour roll call, we have such a great group here. Um, and if people want to see everybody who's here, you can put your Zoom in gallery view in the top right hand corner. But I know we um, had our project scientists stick around. So thank you so much to Brian, Candy and Carl for that. We have Tara and Darlene from the SciStarter team. I know Jennifer Shirk is here from the Citizen Science Association, Vivian White from the NASA Night Sky Network. We have Sarah Kern from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, and of course, um, our fearless moderator, Derek Pitts. For, I, I'm so glad you were in the session, Derek, because uh, Sit Size Sips with Derek Pitts has a really nice ring to it. 
<laughs> Glad to be here sipping with you. Great. Well, Derek, do you have any more questions um, for our, the people who were here today or for any of the folks we have on the line for happy hour? Oh, you know, I really want to find out what questions other people out there have. That's what I want to, I want to go for. So anybody else out there that has a question, come on with it. Pipe right up. Let's hear you. I also had a question for the attendees that are sticking around. I know many of you have attended multiple sessions today, which is so wonderful. I'm wondering what's one thing that inspired you today? If you want to tell us in the chat, we'd love to know that. I've heard, of, I've seen a lot of really great comments about the art, citizen science and art. And I think that's one really beautiful thing this session brought, just all the gorgeous visual, visuals we saw. Um, yeah, we saw the Juno art is amazing. That's awesome. I think one of the nice things about citizen science isn't just that there's, there's new science being realized, but it's that accessibility of science data for the general public. Like it's, it's removing some of this kind of layer of mysticism. Like, like as scientists, we collect data and the general public have this view of, oh, well, that's science data. That's nothing that we could ever understand. But then when you get involved with these citizen science projects and you, you present the data to the public and folks realize that, wow, this is, this is stuff that I can understand this and I can do this. And that's when you start to get really remarkable stuff again, like the Juno cam uh, data and, and certainly some of the, the image processing and the visuals and the, and the artwork that I've seen coming out of the, the comets and the, the Soho data and people looking at the sun and solar explosions and stuff, it's, it's phenomenal. And I, I think that's really one of the kind of the, the knock-on benefits of citizen science that it's, it's achieving that. That is awesome. Oh my gosh, so many amazing citizen science um, insights here. I know Vivian White's here from the NASA Night Sky Network. Um, Vivian, if you want to share a little, I think Tara had such a good question about what inspires people with citizen science. What's one thing that inspires you with your network? You know, I love that anyone can do science, just democratizing science at a really basic level, allowing students and um, someone who might not even be able to get out of their living room can actually do great science um, or, uh, or who just has a telescope in the backyard can contribute to science in such a meaningful way. So um, yeah, I just really love how it involves everyone. And I was inspired. I really wanna uh, make a glaze for pottery that looks like the Juno cam uh, images. I was like, oh, some of the creepy glazes that they have out there. I thought, oh, I think we could make that happen. So that, that's next on my list. <laughs> you know, Let me you just say, say that, um, you... oh, sorry. Ahead, I just Katie. wanted to say that if you go to our website, you will see so many fabulous contributions and, and they're all so different. And, um, you know, I, I get lost almost in just going through one after another and seeing how other people have, uh, you know, looked at the images and, and there's some really fun stuff too, not just, uh, you know, there's one where there's a cup of coffee and the, the cream on top looks like one of Jupiter's zones. And I mean, just really creative things like that. We get a lot of Van Gogh too. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I was just thinking as you were talking about that, Vivian, and uh, Candy, as you were talking about, uh, you know, seeing this in the, in the coffee cup kind of thing, um, it brings to mind for me these different ways of approaching this that Carl's talking about, Brian's talking about, are different avenues of, of accessibility, different ways for people to come into this without having to be scientists. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, uh, the pottery, I think, is a really great one. The art is a really great one. I was wondering if we, if any of us on have seen uh, what's sort of like the most divergent tangent you may have come across coming into the work that you're doing, or coming into the project. Any knitting going on out there? <laughs> 
I think there's a whole group of knitters that are also coders. That was a really good combination I saw. Mm. That's really cool, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, so now it's stimulating me to try to think of ways in which I can invite people from wildly divergent you know, points to maybe join in with something that they can bring to it that's different from uh, what normally comes, comes to it. I guess one other potential area of interest, we've been seeing more and more sonification of data. It's a different way of perceiving data. Mm. And this is of course, very useful for people who perhaps are visually impaired, but mm. are able to then gain real insights into data through having it presented in a different way. But then taking it beyond that, that sonification of data itself can be an inspiration from a musical point of view. And so I think that it'll be very interesting to see the creative pieces of music that come out of sonification of data from so many different sources. Yeah, that's cool. I've heard a bit about sonification too, sure. I like that. Yeah. Very cool. There's a citizen science uh, project in the works actually out of the science activation community that NASA sponsors called um, Sound, what is it? Eclipse Soundscape. And it um, it was, it's coming out of a, the inspiration of a project that was trying to get people who, were, who had um, poor sight, low sight, um, who were experiencing the eclipse that happened, the solar eclipse that happened a couple of years ago. And out of that and out of the incredible experiences that people had and the different kinds of ways that they connected with the eclipse, they're creating a whole new project that should be coming out in the next couple of years. So keep an eye out for that. Nice. Great, cool. Uh, we, we had, had a, I was just gonna mention that uh, we, have, we have somebody from, our, from the, the chat that had a question. Judy, are, if you're on, I think you've been unmuted if you wanted to ask your question. Better yet, I promoted her to panelists. So if Judy wants to be on camera, she can join us on the screen. And actually, Carolyn, can you just uh, repeat what you have in chat there while yeah, Judy comes on definitely. screen? So, um, and first and foremost, thank you so much to Derek for you know moderating for us and to all everybody today for making this icon a success, um, especially to the attendees. If you want to join us for a toast at the close of this, feel free to use the Zoom raise your hand function and we can give you all video access. We're trusting you. Uh, and we can all toast together. I've finished my beverage, but. <laughs> we have a toast, but just know that if you raise your hand and we put you on, you're on camera. So you give us permission to put you on camera and we'll, we'll do a little toast that's, toast that's basically cheers to citizen science. We'll all be on camera here together. And sorry, Derek, didn't mean to divert you from, I think it was Judy's question. And thanks. Yeah, I was just checking if, uh, if Judy, if you had a question, if you wanted to uh, raise your question, go ahead. I don't, I don't really remember what my question was. Oh, <laughs> well, thanks for, thanks for joining us, but I hope you found this all really interesting, exciting, and uh, stimulate you to maybe want to join into one of the projects. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm going to join many of the projects I already have. I love citizen science. I'm on board. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Thanks, Judy. Anybody else out there? Who else is out there? G'day from Australia. Hey, hey, great to have you on board. Thanks. Super. Anybody else from my uh, distant location out there? And if anybody else is on board that's in, involved in another uh, citizen science project, uh, other than the ones we've been talking about here, uh, chime in and let us know uh, what project you might be on. I could contribute to uh, slu.com, S-L-O-O-H.com. Yes, absolutely, sure. I'm a member over there. We'd be happy to have you. Yeah, it's been really helpful to the work that I've been doing. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Who else is up? 
Anybody have an unusual drink they're uh, sipping this afternoon? With a this space morning, I, I have a Juno juice. Ah. <laughs> you probably saw in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Juno juice, I like it. Yeah, Wendy, That's I up. see your hand up. up. And you're still muted. Okay. Try that. Um, yeah. So it's not exactly space related, but I do use this app called Frog ID. It's another citizens science project. It's basically where you go around the neighborhood, and then you get then you record frog calling. So that will account for the millions of frogs that are in, are in Australia. It's a great citizen science project, I should say. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Thanks a lot. That's a good one. Don't forget to put your hand down. Uh, and let's see who else is out there. Uh, I see SN. Sukumar. Yes, thank you. Sukumar from Bombay, India. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great to have you. Thanks. Very cool. Uh, the yeah. background is my national flag. Yes, we can see it. It looks really great there. Excellent. Thank Thanks for joining you. us. Don't forget yeah. to put your hand down. So thank we'll you. know. Sure. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks a lot, folks. This is really great that you've decided to, that you're on board with us. And uh, hopefully you'll be hanging around for some more of the SITSICOM programming that's coming up tomorrow. There's a, little, a lot of really great programming uh, uh, online for that. And uh, don't forget, if, you, uh, if you're new and you haven't, had a, uh, haven't figured out yet how to get on board, uh, it is SciStarter.com slash ORG. I'm sorry, SciStarter dot org slash nasa there we go you know you would think that's water but it could be fun <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh yeah don't forget to go uh there and sign up and uh sign up for an account make up an account for that yeah uh, I, I see a lot of people tuning in who don't feel comfortable or just don't want to be on camera and that's totally cool i was thinking that for those of us who are on camera if you take off your mute we'll do a little cheers on the count of three we'll just say Cheers to citizen science. How's that? And we'll probably do it twice. It's been my experience that it takes a couple of times to nail the timing on these things. And um, actually, Caroline and Tara, I see more and more people joining. Do we want to give it a couple more seconds? You tell me when. Yeah, we'll uh, keep on promoting people, the panelists. If you raise your hand on Zoom, you can join our toast. Um, I'll be taking a screenshot of everybody. Okay. Um, and it's a full house here. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Yeah, welcome everybody. Hey Judy, nice to see you. I see we have some librarians and I would just point out that um, librarians like Judy and others really help us reach out and work with people who traditionally are not part of citizen science. So librarians and other facilitators who are just doing more and more to help us connect to all audiences everywhere because everybody has a right to be part of science. So thank you, Judy, for all the work that you do there. And I recognize some other names here too. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle, what time is it there in Australia right now? It's currently <clears throat> just going 9 a.m. Okay, all right, well. The reason I, I am set drink, man. <laughs> so g'day from Australia, it's Saturday morning. <laughs> Tell actually, us what tomorrow's gonna be like. Is it gonna be good? <laughs> well, actually, I will, I will show you if you like. Hang on a sec. <laughs> This is the beauty of having a, a laptop, right? You can go outside. Oh, nice. And while Michelle That's is cool. doing that, who is super involved in citizen science with the Australia Citizen Science Association, they even had a stamp um, that went out in Australia for citizen science. Um, I also want to point out that we do have some of our presenters for tomorrow's event. So we have a whole day of events for SITSICON lined up for you tomorrow. Vivian, I see here, will be here to tell us about projects you can do with a telescope, both for amateur astronomers and anyone else. There you go, there's the lineup there. Thank you. All right, Michelle, let's see what you have going on outside. And then so, we'll a typical oh, Aussie background, mm -hmm. backyard, yes, barbecue. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes, pool <laughs> and shed, <laughs> always have to have the shed. <laughs> and then next door, that's what my view is usually. Wow. Amazing. Not bad. Not bad. It's okay, beautiful. Michelle. So beautiful day today in, in Queensland. Gorgeous. Cool. 
I put the schedule up for tomorrow, so you you can take a look at it and register at scifestarter.org forward slash NASA, but that's just a preview of what's coming up tomorrow. Nice. All right, let's go back to grid view. I don't know if you can hear my cat screaming in the background, but she might make her way into this toast. So on the count of three, we will say cheers to citizen science. If you have a drink, the green tea I saw, that looked really good. Anything you have there, whatever, put your hands up and then we will just have fun with this, okay? So it's on the count of three and we're gonna do it twice. So it's cheers to citizen wow. science. Ready? Hey. One, two, three. Cheers! Cheers. 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 That's why we do it again. That's right. One more time. When you're ready, ready? One, two, three. Cheers, Cheers to citizen science. science. Nice job, Darlene. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Darlene. Darlene. And in um, Australia, um, it's considered bad form not to have a sip after you say cheers. Oh, well, yep. I didn't put it down. Oh, how about a, how hey. about you then? <laughs> no ready thing. And also, Jennifer, if you can wave your hand too. We have Jennifer from the Citizen Science Association. She's our partner in crime with this whole series here too. So nice to see you, Jennifer. Glad to be here. And this is uh, a a joint event between SciStarter and the Citizen Science Association and also lined up with the event that the CSA has going right now, SITSI Virtual, that is helping project leaders um, share ideas for excellence to make sure these projects are both engaging and scientifically uh, powerful and making an impact for people and uh, the planet and the world. Awesome. Thank Excellent. you. Very All right, cool. Derek, we'll turn it back to Derek to close us out here. <laughs> well, we're so glad you all could join us here today for our program. And uh, we hope that you really caught on to some of the really cool stuff that's going on um, with the Fireballs, with the Juno Cam, and also with Sun Grazer, all really exciting projects. And we hope that that's been inspiring, stimulating, and uh, gets you to consider some other citizen science projects that you might want to jump onto. And also hang around for programming tomorrow. So there's a lot of great stuff on the, on the lineup for tomorrow. Of course you'll enjoy it. And uh, don't forget if you haven't done so already, go to, uh, to, to the website, sign up, set up your own account, and uh, you can find out how to become part of these projects. So uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me as the host. I greatly appreciate it. Darlene, great to see you. Tara, great to see you. Everybody else here, thanks so much. And uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Caroline. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, my God. So Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening. Bye, everybody. All around the world. Good evening. See you, everybody. Good morning. Wendy, catch up with you online later. Huh?